Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion. And thank you to everyone at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit for making this event happen and in, for inviting us to be a part of it. Um, the coronavirus has underscored that the fashion industry is broken. The system needs some change. Um, there is overproduction, there's excessive discounting, there's an unsustainable calendar that's ill-suited to the sustainable development goals. So today we're here to discuss how can key players within the system collaborate to reimagine how the industry can operate within planetary boundaries and also be more inclusive and humane. Uh, back in March of this year, right around the time the lockdown started, my colleague Tim Blanks and I started receiving phone calls and emails and messages from independent fashion designers and brands around the world. Many of them were asking us the same questions. What will happen to my business in this crisis? How do I create a more sustainable business model? Do I need to participate in Fashion Week? In short, they were asking us to help them navigate this crisis. And frankly, Tim and I didn't have all the answers. So we thought, what if we brought all of these smart, talented creatives and entrepreneurs and business leaders from around the world and brought them together? And these individual conversations evolved into weekly Zoom meetings with business and creative leaders from more than 60 independent brands from all over the world focused on rewiring the fashion industry. Then, you know, without any plans, various subgroups began to form, focused on retailers and the unique challenges that they were facing, on sustainability and the core issue of our times and how our industry can play a part in addressing it, and also the experience of Black designers in fashion all over the world. Rewiring fashion just took on a life of its own and became something we all looked forward to in our weekly chats and subgroups as the world faced a public health crisis, an economic crisis, and a racial reckoning all at the same time. So today, I am pleased to welcome Victor Glimo, Creative Director, Shira Sue Carmi, CEO of Altuzara, and Julie Gilhart, Chief Development Officer of Tomorrow London Limited and President of Tomorrow Projects. Each of them were active participants in rewiring fashion, and I invited them here to share their perspectives on what they have learned and where independent fashion brands can go from here. So thank you, Victor, Julie, Shira, for joining us. I wanted to start by asking you what your biggest learning, what your biggest takeaway was from the rewiring fashion sessions. Why did you keep participating in it? And what did you and your company get out of it? And maybe Shira, uh, we could start with you. Yeah. Well, I mean, when March came around, that's really when we went into quarantine and sort of everything came, came about. Um, you know, it was a huge shock to the system. You know, orders were cut and um, you know, there was a big change. We had to relearn how to do things. And honestly, when we first joining Rewiring Fashion, it was really just to get more information, is to see, you know, how, you know, how are the other brands doing? You know, were their orders cut? How much? You know, are they shifting production dates? What are they doing? You know, how are they handling this? And the information piece was really interesting because it was completely unprecedented, but we didn't know what we were getting into. I think what was really interesting is what why was it, why was it unprecedented, Shara? Why was it unprecedented, the information um, thing? That seems really basic. Oh, I mean, the, the scenario was unprecedented and there was no one to right. share, you know, to, to get that information from. So the fact that so many orders were cut overnight, the fact that we had to relearn how to go about the design process and select fabrics on Zoom and, you know, things like that that were completely, you know, that we didn't know we could do before. Um, I think what was interesting and what was so compelling about the sessions was, you know, at the end of the day was a real sense of community. So it went way beyond that sort of like needing information and became about just sharing where you were and understanding that so many other brands were in the same position 
to various degrees and with different nuances, but really in the same position. And there was this really amazing sense of coming together as an industry. And this, you know, in this industry that sometimes is, you know, very competitive and sometimes is very, um, you know, it's not as um, unified. It was a really unifying force, I think, that was really exciting to see. And the, the even more exciting part is that it wasn't only designers. There were also retailers there and also other, that other entities that you could see what their perspective was. And you understood that really people did come together on a lot of things. There really were so many shared commonalities and so many things that everybody agreed didn't make sense. Um, and it was quite inspiring, honestly. So it was, it was really beyond just helping, it was really inspiring to get to that next stage beyond and to see how we can, how can, we can actually improve. Yeah, okay, thank you, Shira. Victor, how about you? Um, you know, what, 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 when you look back at those sessions, all those weeks we spent together uh, on Zoom, like we're on Zoom now, <laughs> what, what, do, what do you take away from it? What do you, what do you, you know, value from that experience? You know, when it started and Ikram sent me a text and asked me if I wanted to join and I instantly said yes. And I thought it was groundbreaking, you know, sort of piggybacking what Shira said to bring all of these global designers, small, bigger brands, you know, groups together, um, international retailers, just fashion industry professionals and giving us a place to be vulnerable, to, you know, really have a sense of community and to realize we were not alone in the things that we were all facing. And it might be a different dollar amount for another brand compared to mine, but we were all facing the same challenges. And it was scary thinking I was alone and texting with a few of my friends and talking to my friends. But once it became global and to see that we were all facing the same similar issues and being squeezed and, and nervous for our livelihoods, um, that was one of the biggest moments to realize that we were all in this together and we could also ideally affect some sort of change for where the industry goes and we could continue to be groundbreaking and to be bold and to stand collectively together. It was great, you know? Yeah. And thank you, Victor. And, and Julie, I mean, you're not an independent designer, but you've had, you know, relationships with and worked with designers for many, many years. You know, what did you take away from it? I mean, it, it was, I was having the same situation that you were having where a lot of people were calling and just asking about what's going on, what can, you know, I'm, 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 there's been a complete meltdown of my business. What can I do? So when you started this WhatsApp group, it was like the perfect place for people to land. And what I didn't realize is how isolated isolated a lot of the different groups, whether it be designers or retailers or showrooms, that they were really managing on their own. And um, COVID just brought to light all the things that were not right with the fashion business, but actually amplified them. And so there was this feeling of like, you know, isolation, loneliness, and you know, what can we do about this? And, and I, I, I feel like if you, if, if, if you can help a part and be a part of that, you can actually help yourself. And I think that's what happened with all the designers is that they immediately started talking to each other. You had high-end luxury group designers talking to a contemporary designer and they were all sharing on an equal platform. It was benchmark. And then, and then the retailers came together and then some showrooms came together and then the subjects became together like, with Victor started in the black for just black designers, that would have never happened from COVID if it hadn't have been for COVID. So I think I think what happened, and then we remember that there was the major looting in New York with, with, with a, a lot of these designers losing a lot of their inventory and sometimes their stores. So all of a sudden the support group had been established. So, and, and it was not, 
you know, it wasn't directed. You, you created the platform, but it was all self-directed. It all of a sudden became a real working community. And I think that's not going to go away. And, and what's been started here mm. is, is that. And I think from that, people can come together, talk about the issues, talk, what's, talk about what's happening and what are the different solutions and, and in each of these subgroups. So it's pretty, pretty incredible. And um, I, I, I'm grateful for that because now all of a sudden we have a, a really useful tool that people can come together and solve the issues that we're still going to have to face. And also develop Absolutely. a new system. I mean, everyone before was talking about how the fashion system had to change. Well, <laughs> it just did. So um, yeah. now we can build sort of like the phoenix burning down. Now we can build it back up. Absolutely. So speaking of challenges, and you know, that's a really positive way to start this conversation, which was, you know, my intention. But the crisis has also broken up, broken open, just how significant the challenges are that our industry is facing. And those are multiple challenges. But you know, I wanted to ask each of you if you had one challenge that you that you're particularly focused on that you think is particularly important right now, um, maybe from your unique vantage point, what would that be, Shira? You know, what's the challenge that that you are, you know, you think is like the most important challenge facing the system, fashion system right now? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things about the fashion industry and how we do things that don't actually make sense. And I think to me, one of the biggest issues is the issue of season seasonality. And, you know, when you try to explain to somebody who's not a part of the industry, but who is a consumer, why, you know, spring dresses are being shipped to the stores in November and why winter coats are being shipped to the stores in May because of pre-collections, of course, nobody understands. And the last thing you want in May is a winter coat. The last thing you want in November is a spring dress. But the problem, and, and it all comes down from the markdown calendar. So basically when the markdowns get closer and closer to the shipping dates, and that, you know, historically, a lot of it was the American department stores with the November, you know, markdowns for Black Friday and things like that. But the, the markdowns are becoming more and more, um, you know, again, closer to the shipping dates of the actual season, the retailers then want the actual deliveries to be earlier and earlier. And what you see is that the delivery calendar and the actual weather and the actual demand from the consumers make absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but because you push the deliveries early and earlier, what you have is pre-collection. So you have the pre-spring collection, the pre-fall collection, which are actually much larger from a volume perspective than the traditional collections that you see in Fashion Week, um, because that is the longest selling period on the floor at full price, which is what the retailers are wanting. And what you see is A, that now you need four showrooms a year four fashion shows a year sometimes, you know, four travel, traveling months a year, which is completely unsustainable, both from a work perspective and a schedule perspective. And then it's completely unsustainable from, a, from an environmental perspective and the impact that it has um, on the one hand. On the other hand, the amount of creativity is usually reserved to the actual collection, to the spring and to fall. But you see all the dollars come in on the pre-collections, which are le much more safe, much less interesting, mu a lot of times, you know, much less um, exciting from a creative standpoint, which is really damaging to the design process as well. So, you know, obviously, you know, markdown dates and regulating them and, you know, figuring out a system that works is a very sensitive topic, especially in the US. You have issues of collusion and you have issues of price fixing. And those are legal issues that we don't want to, um, to step into. At the, but, but at the same time, I think everybody across the industry, and that includes the retailers and that includes the brands, you know, really understands that the system that we have right now is just not working. And if we can get a more um, pushed yeah. back markdown calendar, we can get to a, to a um, we can get the industry to a place where it's a lot more um, sustainable, sensible, um, creative, um, and a lot of good things will flow from there. Yeah. So 
you've raised a lot of really important points there, Sharon. I think, you know, the one of the ways I tie it all together is that actually because of all of this inefficiency, we create a lot of waste. You know, we create a lot of um, wasted product. You know, everything goes on sale. Who knows where, you know, things actually end up. There's a lot of discounting, which is obviously damaging to the brand. And fundamentally, it makes businesses less profitable. So, so Julie, that's where I'm going to turn to you. You know, if Shara's big challenge and focus has been like this, this unsustainable calendar, you know, the drops and deliveries that don't make sense, you know, for you, what's the biggest challenge in the industry right now? Well, I, I have to say it's staying in business. <laughs> I mean, we have to really think about that because there's so many businesses that are just right on the edge. So we have to really look at that and we have to fight for the just the little bit of things that can help people keep in business. So that's the immediate thing that's like staring you in the face every day. Um, but secondly, I think you, we have to think of a different way of approaching the fashion business and we have to design into this. And uh, what is a design, uh, designers, for instance, which I'm always talking to, they have to think differently about designing into circularity, designing into non-ways, designing into using already uh, existing materials. So it's a new way that hasn't been considered creative necessarily, but a creative person can make anything become creative and inspiring, inspiring and imaginative. So if you think about it, if we can keep our most creative people in business, then and create an atmosphere that's without discounting, without you know this sort of exclusivity, I only want your collection, you can't sell to other people, that's gotta go away. And we have to create this environment where they're not always having to create collections four or five, six times a year and can think about how to design into a, a, a more creative way of being responsible to the planet. And I mean, it includes technology for sure. And that's a big expense for many people. Um, but it's also, um, it, it's really about thinking about all aspects of the business. And I think what we really have to go back to, and it's, a, it's, a, it's on repeat all the time, but the big elephant in the room still is consumption. And so until we figure out how to be profitable without driving mass consumption, we're gonna be back in the same place that we always have been. So what that, if you think about it, like think about if you flash back to five, six, seven years ago, we never thought about renting clothes. We never thought of buying luxury um, at resale. Um, we never thought about being excited about a coat that was made from a material that was already had been made into something else. You know, so it, it's these new ways of uh, thinking about design that would be the you know a, a big challenge but i think a creative challenge either and if you put a creative challenge to someone that is creative they take it and they think about it and they come up with stuff that you could never imagine mm -hmm. that's what fashion is and if you think about it mm -hmm. that emotion mm -hmm. is what drives fashion like how many times have you walked out of a show and you thought oh my god i like that just took my breath away we can apply that to more responsible, responsible production and design and, and you know, having less of a footprint on the planet. We just have to reframe it, use the tools that we have, use the support groups and, and, and start to do this together. I don't think it's a solo journey. And I think the next challenge for the designers is to, and creative directors is to work with each other and together on this. It, it can't, it's not affordable to be able to do it on, on oneself. And the high that- So, the so let, Julie, let's- Just talk together. Yeah, let, let's put it to um, our creative on our panel, uh, Victor. You know, Shira is talking about this unsustainable calendar, the discounting, the drops, the kind of mismatched schedule. Julie's talking about designing into the problem and figuring out how to introduce new business models that still enable people to enjoy fashion without necessarily um, relying on kind of endless consumption. Where, where do you see the biggest problem 
we have to solve as an industry. I agree with both of those issues. I think those are very big pressing issues. However, you know, this summer I was really, I was really like driven and awakened to this reckoning that is happening in regards to our industry about race, you know, and the idea that I've perhaps felt this, you know, in my career, that every black designer has the same skill set the same creative vision, the same knowledge is actually tokenizing. You know, what I do versus, you know, the 15 other, you know, great designers out there is completely different. And, you know, this idea of diversity and, and inclusion is a, our, our mar marketing buzzwords that a lot of people use and throw around. However, this summer, when I started talking to young brands and bigger brands and creatives and everyone sort of felt the same, that they were dealing with the personal issues of what was going on with the racial reckoning in America and all over the world, but also professionally. And people felt alone and siloed. And I had never realized that, you know? So putting together this group that was a subgroup of rewiring fashion and quickly became independent, you know, I made that really one of our focuses of building a collective unity for us to get to know one another because that hasn't really existed in, in fashion because of the schedule, because of time, because of competition, because of all of these different things that Julie and Shira mentioned. And now, us creatives coming together, you know, where our, our collective power and when you can't sort of chip us apart and say, you know, we have so-and-so here, we have this one there, so we've checked our black box, you know? Um, but I dress everyone. My clothes are for everyone. You know, my clothes are done in a sustainable way. You know, I only use natural fibers. We use a lot of stock service. There is no overconsumption. You know, I think as much as there's a business strategy behind what I do, we need to recognize that this idea that we are lumped together in an industry where it's, you know, the 50 best black owned brands or whatever it is, is actually demeaning because that doesn't happen to our white counterparts, our Asian counterparts, you know, and, and, the world we are in now, the consumer is looking for an authentic discovery. They're looking for a point of view and there is a new luxury consumer and how people consume things is different. You know, I, I, I'm, I think I'm one of the few people I know who's actually been traveling this year. You know, I've been in Luxembourg, Antwerp and Istanbul recently and I see Virgil sneakers, I see Telfar's bags. I see them mixed with like beautiful Italian, you know, high-end cashmere and I've seen that in every city I just mentioned and this is the world that we're living in and I think our industry is nostalgic for a past for a way things have always been done a traditionalism that the consumer is not interested in because no one wants a spring dress in November you're going to buy it in May when you hopefully are going on vacation or whatever you want to do, you're going to a wedding, that's when you want to buy that dress. And I think one of the, of the several issues facing this industry is this idea that people will bend to fashion's will when that has proven it is not working. No one's interested in that. And it's about truly supporting talent and thinking differently in all different aspects of it. I think that's what this is about. Okay. So, you know, adding up, you know, a lot of what each of you has brought to the table today really kind of, you know, encapsulates the, the variety of the discussions that we were having during rewiring fashion. But the, the thing that I take away from all of you is the role of collaboration, is the role of, you know, putting down these walls and artifice 
and you know divisions that our industry has kind of propagated for years whether that be you know Condé Nast versus Hearst or LVMH versus Caring or one designer versus another designer or one group of designers versus another group of designer or a big department store and another department and store and so for me what was so revelatory about rewiring fashion and the way it happened was that actually by coming together and sharing information and collaborating, it's almost the only way we're gonna be able to get through all of the problems that you guys have, have laid out for us today. So, so I wanted to ask you, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of questions. I'm, I'm just looking at some of the questions coming through um, from, the, from the audience. And you know, one thing we haven't yet discussed today that I'd love to hear your perspectives on is workers' rights. You know, I think the other thing the pandemic made really clear was that certain members of our industry, of our community, you know, either people very early in the supply chain, the people who are making the fabrics or making the clothes, or retail and warehouse workers who are kind of at the other end of the supply chain just before things reach the customer, they have borne the brunt of this crisis, you know, and you know, so, so many people in the, in the chat here are asking, you know, what do we as an industry need to do um, for our workers? You know, and I know that, um, you know, most of you are more on the kind of luxury end of the supply chain, right? So, you know, made, your things are, you know, made in Europe or made in Italy or, um, but there are also challenges and problems in our supply chains where, as it pertains to luxury. And if you've read any of the articles about, you know, garment workers in India, whether they be, you know, you know, working for factories producing for fast fashion or people producing for luxury, when all of these orders started getting canceled, as you, you know, mentioned earlier, Shira, it was these workers that were left without jobs. Like what do we as an industry need to be doing to think more about everybody in our supply chain, everybody from the, the garment workers all the way to the retail workers. I don't know, Shira, um, maybe, maybe you have some thoughts to share on that yeah. first. I mean, I think that there, first of all is recognizing that responsibility and seeing how every actions that you have, whether you're a brand, whether you're a retailer, whether you are um, a manufacturer, everything um, reverberates and everything has a ripple effect. So when the retailer cancels the order, you know, you, you, they go to the brand, the brand goes up ahead and cancels the order and that and, and the factory, if they can, you know, or deals with whatever they, they need to deal with, including laying off workers. So it really is a ripple effect. And I think one of the ways we can, um, we can deal with it is, is exactly what you were talking about before, which is communication and coming together. I think it's very important that you have open communication with every um, every entity in the supply chain. And I think the more communication there is, then you're able to deal with the issues and then you're, ab you're able to confront them. So for instance, when, you know, when we were impacted by the retailers, we turned around and talked to our manufacturers, explained what our situation was and worked together on a plan, whether it's a payment plan, you know, a weekly or a monthly payment plan, you know, so that they know that money is trickling in so that they know that they can turn around and pay, pay their employees, you know, making sure that those, um, that that communication is in place, I think is extremely important. And the same thing goes to our warehouse. We have a warehouse in New Jersey, for instance, that was um, really impacted by COVID. They were understaffed and, you know, so really communicating to them as well about what our, you know, what our volume is going to be so that they can plan ahead so that we can work, really work together. And I think what this what COVID has brought ab um, about, which is exactly what Rewiring Fashion was all about, is that we are all one ecosystem. And I think the more we recognize that and work with each other, the more we can mitigate the impact on each one of the, of the specific uh, elements in it. Julie or Victor, do you have anything to add? Well, you know, for me, as someone who started my brand really focused on a category, I, I really think it's about knowing who your partners are at every level, whether it's your warehouse to your freight forwarder to, you know, everyone in, in, in your supply chain, your, your mills, your fabrics, everyone, because then you can actually have those conversations honestly. And, you know, 
I was lucky where I was able to pay every single person that I worked with through, you know, grants, through, you know, other stimulus things. And that was really important to me. And the transparency of saying, you know, we're gonna pay you on this day at this time when this comes in, that matters, you know, when it was April, May, and there was so much uncertainty. And for me, I've always tried to do that in terms of how I operate my business because I just feel that's the way I want to be treated. You know, we had really frank conversations with retailers. We pulled out of people from the very beginning that were not proper partners um, or I felt that we're not proper partners. And now we're actually talking to those people again and act having better conversations for the future that I think could be really beneficial for them and for us. So I think it's really about being clear about what your goals are and how you want your business to be perceived and how you want to be perceived as well, because we're all in this together. You know, if one part of this crumbles, it all crumbles. And, and I'll never forget, I saw something where like, Dries Van Noten has someone in India who manages all of his like embroideries and all of that. And that's the type of idea that has to go into every part of your business, pre-COVID and especially, mm -hmm. you know, during and post. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've had another question come through, which I think is a really important one to address. And um, Julie, you know, mentioned that, you know, some brands might not survive this crisis. It's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, and as government support, you know, through furlough schemes and other, you know, protection schemes begin to kind of be wound down, um, some of the support that businesses have had relied upon to kind of survive or at least get through this initial phase of the crisis is no longer going to be there. So, you know, what are your views about the need for the fashion industry you know, basically to have fewer players that we're going to have, you know, companies that are just not going to make it through this crisis. Is that a good thing? Um, or is it, is the industry weaker for it? I don't know, Julie, if you have um, any thoughts on that to begin. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's out of our control really. So in terms of that vision of fewer players, but I think that, I think that we have to, it's a really, change is really hard and it feels awful. And so I think it's, that's really what this whole thing is calling for this industry to change. And so, you know, going back to what you were talking about, about supply chain, it even, you know, when you, if you're, if you're, if you're an organic farmer, you have your sources and you commit to them. So we have to stand up to these commitments. So if you're a fashion designer and you're committing to a manufacturer, you need to stay committed through, you know, rain or sunshine. But I think, um, I think that the, the, the need to um, think of different ways to do business is critical and innovation is critical. And it could be as simple as Jonathan Cohen, Cohen pivoting to drawing flowers and doing flower deliveries or some of the other things that many people have pivoted to masks and PPEs. I mean, that's a temporary solution, but that's a big pivot for a lot of people. They saw an opportunity to keep their workers busy, to keep that, the, some cash flow going until they can actually come to a Jesus moment of really knowing what is their new direction going to be. And, it, and as Ellen MacArthur always says, it's a time for unprecedented collaborations. We do not need to prove anything to anybody anymore. We don't need to hold up to this certain status that the fashion industry requires of brands. You don't have to do anything like you did in the past. In fact, if you do it differently, you're more of a hero. So um, it, it, it's absorbing that process that I think is really critical. And I think as a group, we have to work but together. Julie, 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 you didn't answer my question. So I have to push you there. 
Is it okay if designers have to close their businesses? Is that okay? Because the, I think the other stigma we have in this industry is that it's not okay to fail and it's not okay to have to start over. And I think we kind of need to overcome this idea that, you know, every brand that exists in the industry, you know, has to continue to exist in its current form. Well, I'm sorry I didn't answer your question, but I would consider that part of the, <laughs> the equation. Definitely. You can close your business and restart as something else. That is part yeah. of, of radical change. And, and we've seen it before. I mean, classic example in the U.S. is Marc Jacobs, you know, went out of business several times. And, you know, who knows? He may do it again. But, you know, you can always reinvent yourself. And now is the time of reinvention. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shira, Victor, anything to add on the kind of landscape? I mean, you're both, you know, independent brands based in the U.S. And, you know, I'm sure you're having the same conversations I'm having. There's some real challenges out there that are still coming down the road. You know, what does it mean for someone to have to close their business? It's not what you want, but it's, it's an outcome. You know, I, I, when I started doing this business, someone told me, like my good friend, Patrick Robinson, a mentor, he said, there's three ways your business is going to go. You're either going to, you know, continue. You are going to get like, you know, you, you could, excuse me, you can sell it, you can own it, or you can go out of business. Those are the three things that are going to happen to your business. And the third one, you never really consider, you know, and, and, but it's very much an outcome. And I think now more than ever, there are people who are not interested in doing fashion the way it was and showing at the same cadence, at the same speed, you know, with the same amount of stuff. Um, and all of that is possible. And if you want to pause or take a hiatus or completely leave and, you know, Go open a bed and breakfast, great. You know, I think right now, why not explore the ideas that are meaningful to you and not meaningful to, you know, an industry? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry that we only have like a couple minutes left. So I wanted to conclude by asking you each for 30 seconds so that we can fit each of your responses in. Um, on the thing that's giving you hope for the fashion industry in 2021. You know, we're almost at the end of a, what has been an extremely challenging year. But as you look to 2021, I want, I want to end on an optimistic note. Julie, what are you optimistic about for next year? I'm optimistic that I think that industry is beginning to feel like the new cool could be planet over profits. Um, that just sounds right right now. And, but it's not at the expense of creativity and imagination or diversity and inclusion. Um, that we're thinking first about the planet and then we're thinking about how to make money. And I think that's a big shift. And I'm hopeful for that. Indeed. Okay. Shira? As you look ahead to 2021, notwithstanding the challenges that might be in the path ahead of us, what are you optimistic about? I, mean, I think that businesses are doing what they need to do. I think they're cutting costs. I think they're getting more efficient. I think they're focusing on their customer and what their customer actually wants. And I think that those businesses that can do that will be much better off for it on the other side of it. They'll be running tighter ships and, um, and, and honestly, the, the end consumer and the environment will be better off because we'll be making less product, hopefully selling at full price and, um, you know, and getting further ahead. Okay. Victor, uh, I'm going to leave the, the last words here for you. How, how, what makes you hopeful um, for next year for I'm fashion? Hopeful. I'm a hopeful person overall, but for me, I think it's really about, I hope we can dive into the unknown head first. I think it's far more exhilarating and financially rewarding as well. 
Okay. Um, well, I want to share what makes me hopeful um, before we conclude. And, you know, I have to say, you know, when I first came into this industry, everyone kind of warned me, oh, you better watch out. It's a really cutthroat industry. You know, everyone's, everyone's always out to one up the other person. And I have to say, like, you really get this, you know, they say you get this sense of someone's character on how they behave during a crisis. And maybe you get the sense of the character of fashion on how we behave during the crisis. And while all of the decisions that were made, I mean, by all of the companies, like some of them are regrettable, but for the most part, when I saw our industry come together um, through things like rewiring fashion, but all of the different initiatives that have cropped up over the last six months, you know, whether that be in the black or the black and fashion council, or, you know, all of the, you know, the, the work that's being done in Lebanon around, you know, the, you know, the, the crisis that's happened there and the you know, creatives coming together there. It really showed to me that the character of this industry is very different from the way everyone made it out to be to me when I was first starting out. And so when I look to 2021, I think we're going to need a lot more of that spirit and that, that energy and that intention of just letting down all of the artifice because there's one thing true is like everyone in the industry while they behaved during this crisis in a very collaborative way you know as julie said they pivoted to ppe and you know hand gel and hand sanitizer and all the things that we needed um for too long i think our industry has had too many false conversations there's been too much artifice in it and so what I'm, I'm hopeful for is that we'll collaborate more. And what, I, what I'm hopeful for as well is that, you know, we can just all be ourselves in this industry because that, that way um, we can find out where everyone else needs help and we can help each other. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to conclude on that note and by thanking uh, Julie and Shira and Victor, not just for their time today, but these have been three of the most active participants and driving rewiring fashion, which has really been a group led thing. I mean, I only just organized Zoom calls, um, but you know, it was the group of people that really made it all happen. And it's just been super inspiring. And I'm, I'm grateful to Eva and everyone at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit for inviting us to share for the first time, uh, a little bit about how it all happened and kind of what we've learned from it. And, for those of you um, who are watching uh, and listening and want to learn more about rewiring fashion, um, please visit rewiringfashion.org. Um, there's the manifesto there that's been very carefully crafted. And I can tell you that there's more to come. You know, there's more work being done by people like Victor and Shira and Julie. And we hope to share more ideas, more um, provocative direction uh, and more inspiration on how the fashion industry can be rewired. So stay tuned for more from us in the coming weeks and months. And now I, it's my, my opportunity to thank you all and bid you all for well. And thanks to all of you for joining us uh, from wherever you are today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>